So welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here for this Lowy Institute in Conversation event with Professor Raghuram Rajan, one of the world's foremost economists who will be joining us live via video link uh, from the United States. Uh, my name is Roland Raja, and I'm the lead economist here at the Lowy Institute. And let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. I'd also like to acknowledge that we have uh, several senior members of the diplomatic community in the audience, so thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, the way today's session uh, will run is that I will first conduct a 30-minute or so uh, discussion uh, with uh, Professor Rajan uh, over the video link, and then I'll also be leaving uh, plenty of time uh, at the end uh, for questions from our, our, live, our live audience, uh, so please be uh, ready at that moment uh, with your questions. So, of course, amid the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, these are, of course, uh, extraordinary uh, times. So it's a real privilege for us to be able to hear from someone like uh, Professor Rajan's uh, stature and also uh, intellect. He is not only uh, one of the world's uh, top academic economists, but he's also been one of the world's uh, most important uh, policy makers, and he's played a very prominent role in influencing the global uh, economic policy debate for some time. Currently, he is the Catherine Dusik Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School. Previously, he was the 23rd Governor of the Reserve Bank of India from 2013 to 2016. Before that, he served as Chief Economic Advisor to the Indian Government, and from 2003 to 2006, he was Chief Economist of the International Monetary Fund. He is also the author of several uh, best-selling books, including Fault Lines, how Hidden Fractures Still Threaten the World Economy, which was published in 2010, and The Third Pillar, How Markets and the State Hold the Community Behind, published in 2019. So, Raghu, uh, welcome to the Lowy Institute uh, virtually, and uh, thank you for joining us today to share with us your perspectives. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, Raghu, just, just to start off, I mean, you've had a very uh, interesting and varied uh, professional life. So I was wondering whether you, know, you could just share with us a little bit about uh, you know, what that's taught you and how your thinking has evolved as you've you know, traversed all these um, different roles you know, as a, not only a public intellectual, but also an actual top policymaker uh, in India, but also something in between when you were chief economist at the IMF, uh, trying to you know, shape the global policy debate and uh, influence uh, leaders. So you can, can you tell us, you know, what do you sort of take away from all of that in terms of your own uh, thinking about, you know, real world economics, uh, but also uh, policy making? Well, I, I think what uh, you learn over time is humility. Um, you, you learn that, uh, you know, whatever theories you may have, um, they help you understand the world, but the world has a mind of its own. Uh, there are there's a lot of stuff which is not covered by by your theories, and uh, policy making is is really quite difficult because uh, you've got to make decisions under uncertainty. You have uh, no real sense of how it'll pan out. You have to be prepared to react in real time to you know um, actions going off course, and uh, you know you you have to pile up all the policies that will help you get towards your goal, uh, not saying this is enough, but, but make sure you've got enough to actually bend the world to, uh, to what you, where you want it to go, or at least the world that you have any iota of control over. Um, so uh, what does that mean in terms of my own uh, sort of intellectual evolution? Well, I, I certainly, um, sort of come from a relatively poor country, India, which has been, uh, you know, uh, trying to develop into a middle-income country. Uh, so the first question is, when we started, why are we so poor? Uh, what is it that we're doing wrong? And, uh, you know, in, in some ways, the answer wasn't obvious. Uh, um, over time, depending on where you uh, were, uh, you got a flavor of what the problem might be. When I was at MIT, it, it was uh, we're not doing the right kind of development. As I moved to Chicago, it was we've got too much government. Uh, and, and really, the, the problem is uh, excessive government. Uh, 
and then uh, going to the IMF, it was more a balance. How do we how do we get a balance between markets and the government? And then we had the global financial crisis, and uh, somehow neither came out particularly well from that. And uh, and that's that's when the sense of you know what what about everything else beyond the markets, beyond the government? How do we get civil society to participate in a way that you can get the best out of? Uh, both the economic institutions you have, as well as the political institutions you have. And, and somehow it's that delicate balance between uh, the social, the political, and the economic that results in successful societies. And, uh, you know, even when you're there, uh, it can all break down. I mean, we've seen the case of Argentina, which was a rich country at uh, in the early part of the 20th century and has gone downhill since then. But even many industrial countries can't take it for granted today, given their politics, that they will stay where they are. And uh, the politics uh, has its roots in social dysfunction. And so, uh, you know, everything to some extent is interlinked. Going back to my earlier point, uh, you know, you can't really have a model uh, an all-encompassing model of the world. You only have models of little bits of it, and that guides policy, but it's an in, in, incomplete guide. Mm. I mean, it, it is very interesting that um, your last book, the, the Third Pillar, was you know, all about the importance of the community and what can be done to strengthen it. And yet, of course, you're, you're a finance uh, professor, which most people would say is, is pretty you know, far away from that. And that was written in 2019, and you know, you know, one can point to obvious sort of you know, the rise of populism, you know, Donald Trump and, and Trumpism, and, and these sorts of things. It's probably part of the kind of uh, you know motivation. But you know, can you just expand? I mean, what was what was the thinking there? And more importantly, now you know we're trying to come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, things have changed in America, but you know, these sorts of issues are common in many countries. There's also fairly uh, divisive politics in in your own home country in India as well. Um, you know, how are you seeing that situation in terms of right now, how it's evolving, and whether or not, you know, say Biden is trying to do something about it at some level now, are people heading in the right direction? Well, uh, to some extent, the book obviously was written before the pandemic, but it built on some of the dysfunctionality that was emerging in industrial countries. And essentially saying, with the enormous technological change that was happening, uh, societies were, were not prepared. And uh, I mean, you could see it in the divide within society. Uh, one segment has access to high-powered jobs, well-paying jobs, um, caters to a global market. And the other segment finds its opportunities dwindling and the middle-income jobs disappearing and basically being relegated to uh, low-skilled, low-income jobs. And, uh, you know, this is happening in country after country, whether you're an emerging market or a developed country. Uh, but it's most, it hits the most in developed countries that, where there was a sense that the pathway to a comfortable life was open to everyone. And as people realized that, uh, you know, both their pathway as well as the kids' pathway was increasingly under threat, uh, you start getting a lot more anxiety and a lot more dysfunctional politics of the kind that uh, usually is seen in, in poorer countries, uh, which leads you to believe that it's not the poverty of the country that's the problem. It's, it's sort of these different views of uh, depending on where you stand, of, uh, of future possibilities, which drives the dysfunctionality. The, the question then is, is how do you remedy that? And, and, and the answer to some extent is the obvious one, uh, bring opportunity within the reach of, of everyone. Uh, the problem, of course, is that when you say that, the left thinks, ah, that means a lot more government, and the right thinks a lot more market. Uh, but in fact, I mean, neither is, is a complete solution. Uh, to some extent, we've seen a lot of money being poured into education, for example, in the United States, with, uh, with very little impact on the communities that are falling behind. Uh, and the question is why? And sometimes the answer is these, these communities simply don't have the ability uh, to take advantage of that because the fundamental problem is not so much education locally, but it's the lack of economic opportunity, which leads to crime, which leads to uh, 
uh, broken families, social dysfunction, you need to remedy some of that first before you can get you know, people paying attention to schools, to uh, community colleges, to, to the educational path that will take them out of there, uh, is sort of, in many ways, a developmental problem in many industrial countries that areas uh, of disadvantaged people are, are falling behind so far, they would not be out of place in a developing country. And low interest rates or fiscal stimulus doesn't really help them because the pathway for those flows to come into those, those uh, communities are broken. You need to first think how you're gonna develop them to the point where they can actually benefit from those flows and access the national and even international market. That's a developmental problem. Uh, how, do you, how do you elevate uh, a community to the point where you can take advantage of that? And some of that is fixing the immediate problems. So the, the third pillar was really about uh, you know, how do we start treating the problem of, of inequality as a developmental problem in industrial countries? And that means going down to the community level rather than thinking this is a rich country and therefore there shouldn't be a problem. No, it's in many ways a poor country in some parts and we need to figure that, that out. But also uh, it, it was saying that we need to find a new balance between markets, uh, the state and the community in order to make it successful again. And that's, that's to some extent what we have to look for, this, this new balance. And I'd just, I just like to, you know, stick, sticking with the advanced economies in, in the United States uh, for a second, just connect that to the sort of macro picture as well. I mean, you know, I think, you know, people are now, you know, we're in the era of a return of big government, you know, Keynesianism, you know, big spending, that sort of thing. Um, I think, you know, in a lot of your writings and commentary, you've been on the more you know, sort of cautious, certainly, side of, of, yeah. of, of that equation. You want it done, you're not against stimulus, but you want it done right, so to speak. I think, you know, going to these issues about the community level problems, part of the motivation, say, in the Biden administration is thinking along the lines of, you know, they want to run the economy hot in order to, uh, sorry, run the labour market hot in order to reach, you know, the most disadvantaged components uh, of the labour market, the most disadvantaged people. You know, they want to spend a lot of money on, on, on things like uh, childcare and investing in families and education, um, these kinds of things. I mean, connecting these two sort of agendas, what do you make then of the Biden sort of policy agenda and, and where it's headed? Sure, I, I think obviously uh, they are cognizant of some of the problems and uh, want, to, want to try and fix them. Uh, to some extent, the problem is uh, wanting to fix, fix them from the center almost immediately means uh, these, these massive undifferentiated tools. Let's spend you know, enormous amounts on infrastructure. Let's spend enormous amounts on, on community colleges, et cetera. Uh, and and uh, you know, there is some virtue to an untargeted approach. Uh, then you don't pick winners and losers. Uh, you try and engage the middle class. Uh, the middle class is often very vocal in ensuring quality. If you, you know, uh, I think Larry Summers uh, often says that programs, uh, you know, targeted at the poor, poor programs, because the poor don't have the voice, the uh, the ability to stand up for quality. Uh, you know, engage the middle class, and and then the poor will benefit from having the middle class fight on their behalf. The problem, however, in, in, in this, this massive everybody but the rich kind of program is that it is enormously wasteful in terms of spending. And if you're not quite sure what the, uh, what the channel is, what the right approach should be, and development is really hard. Uh, as uh, you, know, you ask any development economist, what's the magic uh, you know, uh, formula and the answer is there's none. We don't know. We don't know how South Korea got rich uh, and while, while Congo stayed poor. Uh, we don't know the uh, magic recipe, but we do recognize it when we said, well, if that's what's going to uh, be the case, you need to have, uh, you know, in the words of Mao, let a thousand flowers bloom, uh, see various experiments, allow for uh, a certain amount of decentralization of what can be decentralized. And, and unfortunately, that's not the approach for the most part. It is these, these, this massive centralization of spending. And you also 
you know, have determined the direction of suspending. We're going to build community colleges. We're going to uh, build uh, this and that and something else. So uh, my, my worry is that, um, you know, they have the right sort of intent. Uh, it is an execution that uh, there's an enormous amount of spending. And of course, the immediate fear in the United States is not so much that the spending will result in a, in a, in a debt crisis for the United States. It still has enormous capacity to sustain more debt. It is that this will result in uh, you know, inflation, uh, inflated asset prices, which may risk tumbling. Uh, all those ills aside from default, which essentially bring the program to an end. And, and that's sort of the worry that uh, if, if we don't target better, if, we don't, if we're not conscious of uh, resource constraints, if we believe that MMT, uh, modern monetary theory, is the name of the game, not Keynesianism, modern monetary theory, spend until you get restricted by inflation, well, uh, we, can, we can go f uh, a lot off track. Mm. I think what you're saying is that there are real constraints out there, and if those constraints are there, then if you don't do this kind of intervention in the best way, then there's a huge opportunity cost, and you may not get uh, to where you, you need you need to go. Where you you, to you get said to. it better than I could. You said it better than I could. That's absolutely right. That you know, don't treat the resource envelope as unrestricted, because it will get restricted at some point. And in the meantime, there are so many pressing needs. You need to prioritize, you need to design well, and you need to decentralize the, the execution to the extent possible because each community, each area has different needs. Uh, don't uh, sort of have this one size fits all sent from the center. Um, and and, and that's, that's, why, uh, that's where I would be a little cautious mm. about what's going on. Can I just get you to tease out back now onto looking at the macro picture and the financial sector? I mean, uh, you were, of course, you know, you know, very uh, prescient with your warnings in 2005 and about the financial sector risks, and then you were sort of proven right in hindsight, one of the few people that can claim that that kind of um, that track record. Um, now, you know, when you look at things, you know, are there any sort of big concerns? I mean, you've already said, of course, that the default question is so far off at this point. There are other issues, but. You know, are there any particular sort of macro financial risks that, that worry you at this point? Well, I mean, to some extent, it's uh, connected to the spending. Uh, I think that for a long time, the Federal Reserve was the only game in town and acted as such. Uh, how do we get activity up uh, when we're at the zero low bound? We have to get real interest rates down. So uh, we need to get people to have reasonable inflation expectations. Uh, in a sense, many central banks were trying to do what Paul Krugman suggested, which is you have to commit to being irresponsible. Despite your uh, you know, inflation targets and so on, you have to commit in some way that you will over, you know, overlook them. Even when you reach those targets, you're going to be uh, sort of accommodative for far longer. It, that's the only way you're going to get inflationary expectations up. You're going to get activity up, and and I think uh, you know um, this notion of uh, targeting inflation over the uh, targeting average inflation over an unspecified horizon is a way of telling the public, uh, look, we will be patient. Uh, and we will not raise interest rates the first time we see inflation hit 2%. We're going to you know, wait, 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 uh, at least for a while. And only then will we act. So it's sort of committing to be at least irresponsible according to the old metric of, uh, of uh, you know, a precise number for the inflation target. Now, that said, I think the Fed was, you know, uh, very vocal on this at a time when uh, you had both uh, adverse economic conditions, but also modest uh, spending. At least, uh, you know, there was a sense that, uh, okay, these were one-offs. Uh, I think since the Fed started uh, articulating the average inflation target and we will hold for the foreseeable future, uh, as well as making statements about you know, we want to see maximum employment. 
that means we want to see the minorities also employed because they get employed at the fag end of the of the labor cycle. Um, after having said all that, you see this enormous amount of spending coming down the line. And, and so when you add the two together, you have a financial market reaction, which is of glee. Uh, lots of spending, lots of activity, uh, and the Fed is going to stay on hold. So we're going to discount high future profits at a low discount rate forever. And, and so we get, uh, uh, you know, everything uh, being valued uh, at really high prices. Now, the Fed, therefore, to some extent, is, uh, is perhaps, and I don't want to put, uh, I don't want to surmise uh, their thinking, but, uh, but I, I think they've gotten more than they wanted. And, and now they, it's hard to back off because the financial markets have essentially climbed on uh, to what the Fed uh, sort of said and, uh, and have reacted. And if the Fed changes its tone at this point, the financial market reaction, both domestically but also internationally, could be substantial. So to some extent, I believe the Fed is a prisoner of circumstances. It will wait and see. I mean, that's the only thing it can do without sort of uh, reversing itself. But, uh, but also, you know, in the best of worlds, uh, the inflation we see will be one off, uh, a function of the recovery of the economy and so on, and some supply constraints. But over the next year or so, by the time people start asking, is the Fed going to act or not, it will revert and the Fed will then be proven right. That is the best of all circumstances for the Fed. And that will sort of support asset prices. Uh, you know, uh, Chairman Powell will come out looking like a genius, much as uh, Alan Greenspan looked like a genius when he predicted, uh, you know, strong productivity growth in 95, 96, and so on. If, however, inflation takes off and, uh, and expectations get unhinged, wage, uh, uh, wages start moving up faster because labor market conditions are tight, especially given the enormous spending, the Fed may be behind the curve. When it decides to act, the financial market consequences, the financial market will, of course, try and second guess the Fed and bring up uh, whatever it expects the Fed to do. But whenever the financial market turns, you have a very, very uh, sort of strange dynamic that would be happening. The financial market will be pushing pressure down on activity, which will then mean the Fed doesn't need to act. But as soon as there's a sense the Fed doesn't need to act, uh, there will be, uh, you know, a movement uh, upwards again in inflation and so on. So uh, you can, I mean, what that means is a lot of volatility. How that plays out, I think, is anybody's guess. But that would mean a lot of volatility at that point. Mm. And you mentioned, as you were saying, that there, there would be, there's going to be an international or could be an international dimension to that. And in particular, I think, possibly for the emerging markets that have sort of had some help from the low interest rate, you know, abundant global liquidity environment. But just before we, we sort of pivot to those sort of issues, just, just you know, a quick sort of question. Zooming back up to the, the, the big level, you know, we're of course coming through the biggest sort of economic shock, uh, say, since the Great uh, Depression. You know, just in general, how are you seeing things from here? Advanced countries first, but then let's shift to emerging markets. And of course, India at some point. Yeah, this, this, the story of emerging markets hasn't come out as much during the last few months with a focus on the new US administration, uh, as well as some of the um, sort of dealings between China and, and the rest of the world. Um, the Northern Asian emerging markets thus far have done quite well. Now, everything we say about growth is vi virus willing, right? Uh, because the virus has a mind of its own and, uh, you know, could upset all calculations if new variants come, which are, which are more virulent. Uh, it seems to be finding interesting ways of combining virulence across variants. Um, I think the, uh, you know, first, the tragedy of emerging markets is certainly on par in terms of being affected by the virus uh, on par with the tragedy in the industrial countries. Uh, my guess is a lot, there's a lot more undercounting in the emerging markets, but the hard hit emerging markets and the ones with reasonable statistics suggest that 
you know, they've been really badly mauled by the virus. So this is a tragedy in, of, in and of itself. But add to that that the amount of uh, financial support, fiscal and financial support that they've been able to give their households, their, their small and medium enterprises, has been much more limited than the support the industrial countries have to give. Now, the rich in the emerging markets have accumulated savings. So when the virus died down in many countries last year, you saw some emergence in growth. But I think that when it came back, uh, you know, even the rich got a little uh, anxious about spending. But the true, real story in terms of uh, sustainability is the, the middle income, is the middle class as well as, as the poor who've been, you know, thwacked by the virus uh, in, in, in many ways. And they haven't had the kind of support that industrial countries have been able to afford. The third blow is, of course, the vaccines that many of these countries don't have access to sufficient vaccine production to vaccinate their populations for a long, long time. Uh, many emerging markets till sometime next year, many developing countries on current path, probably in 2023. That's a long time to be anxious to see the waves of the virus. And, and the notion that you know, South Asia and, and Africa would be immune to the virus which was, you know, these are people who've been hit by all sorts of uh, viruses in their youth and therefore are, are, are hardy. That has been put to bed with, uh, with what happened in India. Uh, mm. and, and so my sense is that uh, if we are not more forthcoming in the industrial world about what is happening in the emerging markets and developing countries, and being a lot more uh, sympathetic to the need to distribute vaccines widely to uh, you know, the, the break between industrial countries and, and, and poorer countries will be significant. Uh, there is no point talking about a coalition of democracies when uh, you know the the word on the African street is, are you going to vaccinate your dogs before you send the vaccines to us? That is, I mean, is a recipe for for a disastrous break. And and you know, I I, I think we need global leadership on this. I'm glad the G7 is is talking about it, but we need more action on how some of the frontline people in these countries can be vaccinated early so that uh, they have some resilience, doctors, medical personnel. And it may mean more than just sending the vaccine. It may mean helping organize the distribution of the vaccine. Many countries have their own ability to do that. Some don't. But it also means organizing the production. Can we spend some of the money in getting some of our vaccine manufacturers to up their game and invest much more. I think the IMF came out with a, a paper recently suggesting the returns to such an investment would be huge. I think the returns to such an investment would not just be economic, it would be political. It would suggest there is still uh, hope in global cooperation. Hmm. I mean, there's a lot more that I'd, I'd love to talk to you about on those on some of those issues, but, but I'd like to bring you to to india in particular of, of course i mean obviously it's a very tragic and sad situation there at the moment i mean just to start off with i mean how do you see this affecting the country um and you know what's the way out for them well i i i think the second wave uh, certainly caught uh, much of the country by surprise um i think the prevailing uh, view was was something um, had protected us, uh, and uh, and therefore we were relatively immune to fresh waves, and and the second wave, uh, you know, put paid to that belief. Um, I think the, um, you know, I mean, we can go back and see the various ways we we should have prepared better. Uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. Uh, but, you know, there were certain aspects of vaccine acquisition. Uh, to India's credit, it distributed the vaccine to a number of countries before vaccinating its own population. 
perhaps under the belief that its population was relatively well protected. Nevertheless, this is more than many countries have done. Uh, now, of course, we are seeing that perhaps it was better to vaccinate your own population uh, earlier on. Uh, certainly from a political aspect, that would have made more sense. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, uh, again, India is a big country. There are some states, uh, Kerala, for example, that, uh, and, you know, even Maharashtra, which had a very, very bad attack, which also have managed in adversity uh, in ways that uh, that sort of are an example to the rest of the country, centralizing resources, distributing them fairly, and so on. Going forward, uh, I think, uh, you know, this is a wake-up call that our old ways of doing business don't work. Uh, and we need, uh, you know, to rethink what what has gone wrong. And hopefully the silver lining will, will be that, uh, that this prompts a, a dramatic rethink of India's policies, and uh, and we get back uh, both on the uh, certainly on the medical side, you're seeing some bottoming out certainly in the cities, in the in the villages and rural areas harder to count what what exactly is going on, but hopefully we're seeing some attenuation of the virus right now, and uh, we're we're India will be much more wa uh, wary going forward and is certainly pulling out all all stops to get the population vaccinated. What, what about then, um, you know, just when you think about the economy, obviously on the short term side of things, I mean, it's, it's going to be very, very negative. Um, the financial system's already in a bit of, in a, bit of a mess, not a lot of f fiscal space either. Um, so just short term, but also, you know, just long term. I mean, India was supposed to be growing, hopefully, six, at least 6%, maybe 7% plus, depending on, 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 on whose expectations. Um, you know, how, what's your own feeling about India's, um, you know, outlook, you know, given what's happened? Well, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, the, the temptation is to be very bleak and to say, you know, there's a lot of scarring which we don't quite, uh, uh, we, which we haven't quite measured. Uh, and uh, when you look at demand, especially consumption, uh, the latest numbers don't look, uh, look great. It, it, it grew relatively slowly compared to the other measures. And, and going forward with the middle class uh, being scarred by the, uh, by the lockdowns, by the uh, debts, uh, maybe they may be tempted more to save rather than spend. And the poor don't have the purchasing power and have been, uh, many of them uh, sort of live from hand to mouth. And without the buffers, uh, it looks relatively bleak. As I said, uh, I mean, India is a democracy. Uh, democracies tend to have self-correcting mechanisms. And, and so uh, the hope is that uh, the self-correcting mechanism will start uh, and uh, you know, our leaders will start paying attention to what's going wrong. And, uh, and therefore, you get course correction. Uh, now, remember, India wasn't growing uh, particularly fast even before the pandemic. After you know, uh, 20 plus years of 7% plus growth. Uh, for the last uh, uh, seven or eight years, we have not been growing that, that fast. And that suggests the old sort of um, pathways are, are not proving as fruitful. We need to think about a new generation of reforms. And uh, so along with all the um, sort of learning from the pandemic, including what India needs to do on the medical front, uh, as well as on the social security fund front, the picture of migrants, uh, you know, running from the cities because there's no social support there. Uh, I mean, those things we need to remedy, but at the same time, we also need to reinvent our growth path. And, uh, and I think that there are ways that India can, uh, I mean, one, one interesting way, uh, this might, uh, uh, you know, uh, India is, is obviously a player in, in services, uh, and uh, we have a lot of uh, very capable accountants, consultants, uh, doctors, etc. Uh, but high high uh, high tech services uh, require a lot of confidence in rule of law, in uh, in privacy, in uh, in the fact that uh, governments can't get at your information, and so on. If India played its cards right, it could. Uh, you know, uh, be a, a strong alternative, uh, given the cheap, uh, relatively cheap uh, services that it can provide, uh, 
but uh, at the same time assuring some institutional sort of uh, support. And that's, that's an important uh, uh, path that we can take, uh, but we do need to reform our structure so that uh, we can give people that confidence uh, that they can come buy Indian services without their details being available uh, to parties who shouldn't have it. Mm. Might um, turn to our audience if we have um, uh, any questions um, to, to put to Professor Rajan. Um, yeah, we'll just go to um, David at the front. If you just usual rules, just um, state your name, any affiliation, and, um, and uh, uh, stick to a question. <laughs> Look, thank you very much, Raghu. My name is David Orsmond from Macquarie University. Um, I want You've touched at several points on your discussion, very deep discussion, on economic and social trends, on essentially populism. Um, now, you know, in crude terms, you can think about when we've seen populism in the past, Latin America, you know, you get three phases. The first is the enthusiasm, as everyone thinks, this is the new nirvana. The second is the realisation of incompetence in dealing with the economy, social issues and so forth. And then the third is the fading away of populism to, towards something different. We've see, certainly seen in many countries the first two of those processes in several countries around the world. Are we seeing the third with the fade of, fading of populism in the exposure of the mismanagement of uh, social and economic trends that come from that? And if not, then why not? I think we're seeing some of it, right? I mean, certainly in the United States, uh, many would credit uh, President Biden's victory uh, to the mismanagement of the COVID, um, uh, of COVID by the Trump administration. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there are some populists who have managed it reasonably. Um, Urban, uh, you know, you could argue has done a reasonable job. But there are other populists, uh, uh, you know, who haven't. And this is certainly uh, something which you may argue is, is, a, is a feature of populism. The belief that you know uh, that the experts don't, and therefore uh, you've got it right. And, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, all it takes is the will of the people expressed in you to make dramatic moves. Which, uh, which often uh, can be more problematic and, and exacerbate the situation. You know, Bolsonaro's let's not, uh, let's not vaccinate. Uh, this, is, this is not a serious thing. And if you only have to be manly to avoid the, the disease. I'm, I'm obviously oversimplifying his views. But uh, I mean, those things people uh, latch onto. The question is, is there a viable alternative? Sometimes these populists essentially crush uh, the, the opposition. And uh, you know, often they are very, very charismatic politicians themselves. And so it appears that there's nobody who can stand up to them. Uh, I think uh, you know, uh, bad events, incompetence tends to highlight uh, the fact that these are not omniscient, omnipotent politicians. Uh, but it requires an opposition which has the capabilities and is not silenced to highlight this. And in some countries, there's not really much of an opposition. Uh, I'll take Russia, for example. So, so I, you know, to your point, uh, I think in some places uh, where there has been substantial incompetence, you are seeing a change. Now, the last thing I will say is, as you well know, uh, the, uh, often the populist leader uh, espouses an anti-elite view. And, and to some extent, it's also possible to argue your fate, why you're doing so badly, is because you're not part of the elite. See, I give you the goodies, and these other guys uh, want to take it away from, from you. Uh, continue trusting me, and I will still continue to giving you the good goodies. And you know, wor don't worry about uh, COVID. Nobody could have prevented that. Uh, and, and don't blame me for it. Uh, none of these guys could also. You know that that can still resonate. So so you need a clever political opposition to to make the point that there is a viable alternative and we could have done better. Uh, and I think because we don't have that in some countries, you see the continuance of uh, of populist despite underperformance. Mm. Let's go to another 
question just over here. Hi, yeah. um, Alyssa Lang from the Lowe Institute. I'm just going back to the US. I know you talked about some risks around wastage and inadequate targeting of stimulus under current policy settings. Um, but taking them as given, how likely do you see the prospect of um, overheating or accelerating inflation as Larry Summers has been talking about lately? Well, uh, so uh, overheating would have a number of components, right? Uh, the first would be, of course, the massive spending. Uh, and, uh, you know, to some extent, the Janet Yellen response to that would be, well, the labor market still has a fair amount of slack. Uh, there are, you know, 10 million people uh, in uh, who, who still haven't come back to the labor roles. And so it has some way to go before we see it uh, uh, sort of top out. Uh, the question, however, is first, are they going to come back to the old jobs or is, it, is there a fundamental mismatch which uh, in the post-COVID world, which makes it hard to uh, get them back? So they're not really a reserve army holding wages down. Uh, the second is that, you know, with this uh, confidence built by the spending over time, do other components of demand come in, uh, investment, for example, uh, and, and we are seeing some, some fairly strong investment. So, uh, you know, is there resilience in demand be beyond the, the spending, which continues for some time, and therefore, uh, you know, is part of the, the overheating story. Uh, and uh, so I, I think these are uh, some of the factors that will, uh, will um, sort of play out. Uh, the third uh, is expectations. Uh, you know, how firmly anchored are inflationary expectations? Do we, uh, you know, so if you, if you talk to a Janet Yellen or a, a Jerome Powell, they look back at the last 10 years and say, you know, people have gotten used to a very low rate of inflation they are going to look through these, these uh, sort of bursts and basically conclude beyond that that it's going to come back and stay fixed. Well, if, if on the other hand, they don't, and all the sort of pro-labor policies that we see uh, emerging, including a $15 minimum wage, but also more union support, et cetera, all that combines not only to, uh, you know, in an environment of elevated inflationary expectations, make wage demands more uh, sort of uh, more effective, I think you could get the beginnings of, uh, of uh, stronger inflation. The bottom line, uh, um, let me add one last bit to this, which is that the global competition has been keeping prices down also. But the flip side of that is growing uh, sort of oligopolistic uh, firms in, in some industrial countries. So unchecked by global competition, do, do the oligopolistic firms sort of find more pricing power and the, uh, the ability to push uh, some of the cost increases into prices. The bottom line, I think, is that, you know, both sides have arguments in their favor. The, the you know, don't worry, be happy side is look at the past 10 years and nothing really has, has uh, stuck out. And the Larry Summers, uh, uh, Martin Wolf and others, you know, this is different uh, because of the size of the spending, as well as the views of the policymakers. Their sort of tolerance itself makes inflation more likely. If they were hawks, you would be less worried. I side with the, uh, the Larry Summers, Martin Wolf uh, side, thinking that, you know, um, there's more danger that it breaks out on the upside. It's not, you know, um, I wouldn't say it's the overwhelming possibility, but it's high enough that we should be somewhat worried, in which case I would have preferred far more cautious spending. Mm. Just a, a follow up on that, Rigu, is, um, you know, if you do have, you know, major central banks like the Fed lifting interest rates, possibly, you know, a bit more forcefully than they did um, over the past decade, um, you know, what does that mean for the emerging markets then, particularly if they're still in a lot of economic trouble? from the effects of the pandemic. Um, is that something that worries you, that you have something that looks like a rerun of the taper tantrum, except at a time when emerging economies are hurting a lot more and possibly with a, a sharper rise in, in, in borrowing costs? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the history of emerging markets has been that when the dollar strengthens, when dollar interest rates go up, 
emerging markets get hit uh, reasonably badly. We already saw a preview of that with the early days of the pandemic when we saw some capital flowing out of emerging markets. We saw stock markets plummet there uh, way before uh, the pandemic had hit those countries. But, uh, but now uh, uh, many of them are trading at, uh, at all-time highs, uh, stock markets. Now, it's, it's hard to, I, I think what we have is an undifferentiated uh, sort of financial sector uh, search for yield across the world. And uh, as the, uh, you know, as the central banks tighten interest rates, you will see the consequences. Uh, can these countries prepare now? Well, many of them are trying to prepare the way for tighter monetary policy, saying we simply can't afford to be as, as uh, lax as we were, uh, given our plummeting exchange rate, etc. cetera. But, uh, but I think it's still early days. They haven't had these signals, in, 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 and, and there are a number of countries which still maintain very accommodative policies. If there's a sense the Fed will turn, uh, I think their policy room will, certainly central bank policy room will shrink considerably, but also I, I think we will see some impact on asset prices. Mm. Um, do we have a question at the, at the back? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sam Rogovine from the Lowy Institute. Professor, uh, your, the first question was about your intellectual development and you emphasise the importance of humility. In that spirit, I wonder if you could look back over the last 18 months and perhaps tell us about what you got wrong. What's the biggest thing you've changed your mind about since the pandemic began? Well, it, it may be something small, uh, but I, I, I think it reflects, yes, this, this need for humility. Well, as the pandemic hit, I was worried about corporate defaults uh, because I thought, you know, um, uh, with the kind of damage that's being done, uh, we're going to see far more bankruptcies. Uh, we're going to see small and medium enterprises in huge distress. And therefore, it's extremely important to figure out how to deal with them uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, we need to figure out alternative bankruptcy mechanisms, which will be quick, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is, you know, bankruptcy is the dog that didn't bark, right? I mean, you haven't seen, in fact, if you look at bankruptcy filings, it's actually gone down in, 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 in many industrial countries. And some of that is the massive, massive amount of support. Some of that is private sector forbearance. Uh, banks aren't pulling the plug, sometimes because they uh, have been told not to, sometimes because they uh, basically are trying to ride this out and then see what happens with the support of their regulators. So. That's one thing I got fundamentally wrong. Uh, I still think that as we emerge, the need for repair will be significant. Uh, as the moratoria come to an end, as the, um, you know, the debt buildup, as well as the central bank support to that debt buildup uh, comes off, uh, you will start seeing uh, many more bankruptcies than in the past, but it certainly wasn't uh, as dramatic as I feared initially. And, uh, and it may well be that the real problem is in many emerging markets that haven't been able to support their firms to this extent. Um, unfortunately, we are uh, out of time. Um, so let me thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today virtually. And I, and I really do hope that uh, perhaps in the not too distant future, we'll be able to have you here actually uh, in person uh, sometime soon. Uh, but thank you very much for sharing your uh, perspectives. And everyone Thank you, Roland. Thank you, and uh, bye to everyone. Thank you.